Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, actually, sometimes that I don't give a webinar, so <laughs> I need to go back into this uh, new uh, yeah, format that was pretty familiar some time ago. So I'm going to talk about the structure characterization of messenger RNA living nanoparticles. And uh, just to give a bit of context on why we are interested on uh, mRNA therapeutics, in case uh, you're still wondering. Well, basically, if you have managed to deliver RNA or DNA you uh, directly in the cell, you have a huge advantage compared to when you deliver proteins, because you could silence a gene, you could express the protein in the like, biological environment where it's needed, and you can as well edit defective genes. So. The promise is huge, but there are some challenges to overcome. And uh, RNA is a long chain of negative charges, basically. And it's not that easy to, um, yeah, on, on its own, it's not gonna cross the membrane. And on top of that, in the body, there is plenty of enzyme that are ready to degrade RNA that is from, um, from outside as a protection, of course. So we need to encapsulate RNA for two main reasons. One is to make it cross the cell membrane and get to the cytoplasm, and the other is to protect it from degradation. So we need to find a biocompatible vehicle. Now, as my title was pretty clear, I'm interested in looking at living nanoparticles to do that. But before going to the work, I wanted to just uh, give you some time to reflect on this uh, timeline, which I find very fascinating. The mRNA field and the lipid nanoparticle intended as a general lipid self-assembly kind of started in a similar time back in the 60s, and then they evolved. And very soon after we started to know, to know about RNA and lipids and how to make liposome, there was an attempt to actually encapsulate RNA in liposome already back in the 70s. So there are several points here, just a few of the milestones that uh, were reached in the, during the time, and it's not that we suddenly got living nanoparticle to work, there was a lot of effort to get there. And yeah, we all know that these nice parallel lines actually ended up on being a very useful formulation that protected us from the COVID pandemic and kind of made us go back to normal life. So just to now, come back to the science and the samples. So lipid nanoparticle, as the name says, is a multi-component lipid formulation where we have a cationic inizable lipid, which is, let's say, the main actor in this formulation because it's a lipid that has a positive charge when in low pH, which is when you formulate the particle and you will see as well later on in the body. And, uh, and then while when uh, you increase pH, so in physiological pH, the, the charge um, uh, is lost. Well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's not ionized anymore, so it becomes neutral. And that means that this vehicle is less toxic to the, to the cells. So that is the main, the main actor because it's the one that actually encapsulates mRNA. So the positive charge will bind to the negative charge and encapsulate RNA in low pH environment, and then maintain this protection along the way. Then we have other two very important uh, components, which are the phospholipid, in this case is the SPC, and cholesterol. And those are helping stabilizing the particle and, uh, and help fuse with the endosome and so on. So they help the particle in the function. And then there is some uh, uh, pegylated lipid that adds some colloidal stability to the formulation, helps tune the size, protects uh, or at least reduce a bit 
protein binding once in body fluids. And, um, and yeah, basically these are the main functions. And of course, RNA, which is the cargo of this uh, formulation. Now, so as Vito said, I've been using neutroscattering since basically my master thesis. And this is a very nice system to look at with scattering, in my opinion. And uh, I've um, I decided to use small angle neutron scattering and contrast variation. I guess this audience doesn't really need a thorough introduction on the technique, but uh, I just want to point out that when you perform SANS, your sample is in solution. So basically you can have conditions that are close to uh, the condition that you store your sample or that the sample can encounter when delivered uh, to, the, to the patient. And SANS, as, um, as you can see here, basically you have your sample, you have an incident beam that could be X-ray or neutrons. Most of what I will talk about will be neutrons. And you just collect the scattered beam on a 2D detector. And uh, then just radially averaging this scattered intensity, you get the, the well, pretty probably a uh, very well-known intensity versus Q curve that already just looking at the shape will tell you a lot about what's the shape of your particle in solution, what's the size and thanks to contrast variation, so taking advantage of what nature decided to do, so to give a very different cross-section to hydrogen and deuterium, we can uh, play around substituting hydrogen with deuterium and we can match different parts of what we have in the sample. For example, here there is the scattering and density of different um, biomolecules and uh, the content of D2O in the solvent and depend changing the content of D2O you can match the, uh, the the intensity, the scattering density of this of these different molecules, which means you can either highlight or um, cover completely their intensity. So a more a clearer example is like a core shell particle, as you can see here. If you have a system that has is in a solvent, everything has a very different contrast than. You can, of course, look at this as it is without changing anything, but it will be a bit difficult to get all the information out and understand well the shell, the core, the sizes, and all the contrast that, uh, um, that describe the system. But if you take an advantage of the mixing of deuterated water and uh, regular water, you could, for example, match the scattering Land density of the core and I like just the shell and uh, and vice versa you could match the scattering of the shell by putting the solvent contrast the same as the shell and then highlight the core and this gives you the possibility to basically have two image of the same system in different condition and allows you to uh, strengthen your analysis basically so you can you can reduce the number of parameters the free parameter that you have when you have this kind of uh, this kind of results so that's that's very powerful and that's what uh, we decided to use to look at living nanoparticles since it's a multi-component system the work started uh, after was published the first work i think is the first work i'm pretty sure um where SANS was used to, lose, to look at living nanoparticles. This, uh, in, in this work, they only had the DSPC deuterated, and as you can see here, is just a minor, um, the, the content is not that high of the DSPC, but still is, it was the available deuterated version commercially. So they looked at the living nanoparticle, substituting the DSPC where they, the iterated uh, version. And uh, what they could uh, conclude was uh, that uh, <clears throat> there was this DSPC, which is the deuterated one, is mostly at the shell. But now let's maybe go back a little bit. So here 
you have the scattering curves, a different uh, um, D2O content, as we have shown uh, before, so taking advantage of contrast variation. And here is the scattering density as a function of the radius of the particle. So this is the, cent the distance from the center. And you can see that uh, the, there is a core a shell and some kind of shell with increasing solvent uh, content. And one thing that we learn from this, uh, from this work is that the SLD of the core actually follows the solvent contrast, which is telling us that the core is not dry. So there is water in the core. And that's something that without sense you couldn't really conclude. So a lot of structure work done on this living particle is most, was done with cryotm, and, uh, and you can't really you can't really distinguish well the content of water if it's not highly hydrated, like a liposome, which is basically water, the core. So here we learn that we have solvent in the core, and we learn that there is a shell that is basically dry. And since the only component deuterated there was the SPC, the conclusion of this work was that the SPC is mostly at the shell of these particles. And uh, this was the structure proposed uh, by Janet Zerteta and collaborators. I had the uh, opportunity to work together with Janet Zerteta and we started together a project that was funded by a funding agency in Sweden where I was working before at Malmo University. And we decided to continue working on the same formulation, but just using different deuterated component, because as, as I said, the SPC is just a minor component of the, of the formulation, but there are cholesterol and cationic and anisobolipid that are present in a lot larger amount. So we, we had the, the possibility to use cholesterol deuterated, which was produced custom made by different deuteration facility, both from ILL and ASTO, and, um, and that helped us localize cholesterol. Then we, we had a kind of combined deuteration scheme where we had both the SPC and cholesterol deuterated. And, um, and in the end, we had the deuterated cadenianic kinesable lipid, which was produced by the uh, chemists in AstraZeneca, which were part of the collaboration. And this helped us localize the cadenianic kinesable lipid. So what we did, again, was to have exactly the same molar composition, just different deuteration scheme, and collect uh, scattering curves in different D2 solvents. And uh, Already just looking at the uh, scattering curve, we can learn a lot about the sample knowing the deuterated content. So for example, if you look at the low Q region in, uh, in this, uh, <clears throat> this region here, you see that when you have low content of the 2 there is a clear indication of a core structure. And uh, in low content of the 2 o the, the uh, mainly the visible component here is the deuterated cholesterol. So that can tell us that cholesterol somehow is not homogeneously distributed across the particle. And uh, to confirm, if you increase the 2 so you go toward matching cholesterol, you lose the feature. While if you jump to the formulation where we have only cationic and isobolipid deuterated, we see that this feature of core shell, it's actually most visible in higher D2 content, where again, cholesterol is visible because it's hydrogenated. So that's, that's already something kind of pointing us in the right direction. Where is the component? And the other information we can get just looking at the, at the sun's curve without any analysis is that we have this uh, kind of broad peak around uh, this Q, which corresponds to about a 65 angstrom distance, repeating distance. And this is visible mostly in this two deuteration scheme where the cationic kinesable lipid is hydrogenated. Sorry. And, uh, and the D2O content is higher. So that is where 
the cationic energy of Bolivia has the largest contrast. While when we have it deuterated, we completely lose this feature. And um, that's so by this is because here the cationic energy of Bolivia is matched in the higher content of D2O, while in uh, uh, lower content of D2O is the incoherent background that is too high and just covers up the peak. So again, what we kind of, our guess, just looking at the data as they are, is that cholesterol is not homogeneously distributed in the particle and cationic, the cationic anisobolipid is the one that gives rise to this peak that kind of uh, gives us an idea of what the internal structure is. So there is some kind of repeating distance. We cannot say which kind of structure it is, if lamellar, inverse hexagonal, or whatever, but for sure there is something that gives rise to the internal structure, but we only have one peak, so that's not conclusive. But um, of course, we did fitting, we combined the coarsal sphere and the broad peak to catch this feature of the of the peak, as I said, and uh, from the coarser sphere, we get basically four main parameters, so the radius of the core, the thickness of the shell, and then the scattering density of the two uh, compartments. And uh, by knowing what are the components that we have in there, what are what is their volume, molecular volume, we can understand how, we, how they are distributed to result in the scattering density that we get. And this is kind of a um, yeah, way to um, image or, well, in the, propose, uh, the, the proposal we make to say that our cholesterol, so the green, the green particle, the green component is the one deuterated and then the rest is more or less gray. They are very similar in scattering and density when they're not deuterated. So what we could say is that the cholesterol is more concentrated in the shell than in the core. When we add the deuterated DSPC, the shell is even more highlighted. And then when we have deuterated cationic lipid, we see that is mostly in the core. So this is kind of the picture that we could reconstruct based on the scattering um, scattering data. And, uh, and this was done in pH 7.4 in just buffer without anything else in there at room temperature. Now, we wanted to try to, yeah, learn a bit more about this particle. They are, they are made through microfluidic mixing and they're kind in a trapped equilibrium state. It's not a thermodynamically stable particle. So it's kind of expected that they're gonna change as soon as they, are in different environment. So one one thing that is uh, uh, one mechanism of uptake of this particle when administered intravenously is that apolipoprotein E binds to lipid nanoparticle. And apolipoprotein E is a protein that is present in the serum that binds lipoprotein particle that is uh, uh, responsible for trafficking fat in the body. So it doesn't really recognize if it's an endogenous lipoparticle lipo or is uh, external. So it can just reversely bind from, go from HDL and LDL to lipid nanoparticles. And the idea is that as soon as it gets um, bound to the lipid nanoparticle, then the lipid nanoparticle can be taken through the surface receptor to actually recognize APOE bound to lipid particles. And once, um, this is bound, then it trapped in the endosome, and there happens the release of mRNA. But we can talk about that a bit later. Now, what we were interested to understand at this point was this stage. So once the protein interacts with the lipoprotein E, what happens upon this binding? Does it change the particle, or is just bound, is just a corona 
like not interacting with the, with the delivery system. So to, to investigate this, we decided again to go back to hands and contrast matching, and we took advantage of the different iterated uh, version of lipids we had to design a formulation that was completely invisible. And it needed to be invisible, not in a random solvent, but in a solvent made up of 46% deuterated water, because that's where the protein itself in native state, so non-deuterated, is invisible. And, uh, and you can see here that the lipid nanoparticle with this specific composition, the protein alone and the buffer, they all overlap and they are all background, basically. This is just the typical uh, contrast match plot that you would make to find the match point of, of uh, your system. And this was the lipid nanoparticle. So it's clearly, yeah, minimize the intensity when you are at 46% D2. And now we had everything invisible and we decided, okay, now let's, let's mix the protein with the particle. If the two, if the protein just binds to the particle without affecting the arrangement of components, then we shouldn't see any change. It should just give exactly the same. It would just be the sum of the two intensity. While what we got after the binding was an increase in, in scattering. And this is not a major increase. You can clearly see the signal is tiny. But that was an indication that something was happening and that the protein was affecting the lipid nanoparticle uh, component distribution. So we uh, repeated the incubation with the other formulation. So the formulation having different deuteration schemes, again, where only cholesterol was deuterated, where only the cationic inasable lipid was deuterated, and where we had both cholesterol and the SPC deuterated. And you see in black are the data points of the sample before incubation, and in blue is upon incubation with APOE. And especially for the sample containing cholesterol deuterate, we see a clear shift. And again, this is not the protein that shows up because the protein is invisible in this contrast, it's the 46% D2O. It's the particle itself that sees a redistribution of components. So fitting these, uh, the data after incubation, we could uh, conclude that the binding of APOE affects the distribution and uh, drives the cholesterol even more in the shell while the cationic inasable lipid is pushed toward the core. So that that's that's a pretty interesting finding because that could mean that the fact that the endosomal escape is not so good for these lipid nanoparticles. So the fact that you don't really have this positive charge at the outside could be due as well to what happens to the particle once in the blood interact with protein. But of course, this is just a single protein is not blood, but this kind of points us in the direction that we should try to look at structure and to, to look at the system in situations that are closer to reality to be able to learn more of what happens to them. And um, just to co um, complement the data we collect, uh, collected from SANS was to measure the sucks of these particles and kind of zoom in in the internal structure. And what we could see is that even the internal structure was affected by the binding of APOE. And here we tested as well, we followed up on the hydrodynamic radius and the encapsulation efficiency. So that is how much of the RNA present is actually inside the particle. And we can see that uh, the uh, hydrodynamic radius doesn't change at all, no matter how much protein you add, no matter the, uh, how much time you wait for the incubation to go on. So th this is important to show because sometimes we rely too much on DLS. So even if DLS doesn't show any change, it's important 
to look into the system with more advanced methods because change may be in a other landscape as we as we uh, found and um, and here is shown how much of the mRNA is encapsulated upon binding. And you can see that the RNA, actually, the encapsulation goes down as soon as you increase APOE uh, content and as soon as you wait longer for the, for the protein and the particle to incubate. So what we see, this redistribution of component actually does affect as well the ability to keep the mRNA encapsulated in the particle. So that's another important point to keep in mind. Now, if we go back to this uh, theme of how the deep nanoparticles are thought to be uptaken by cells, the, the other like point that uh, uh, got our interest is once the lipid nanoparticle is trapped in the endosome, in the endosome, the pH drops. And there, what is hypothesized is that the lipid nanoparticle becomes positively charged because the cationic kinesable lipid at lower pH is positively charged, while the endosomal membrane is negatively charged. And then these two should fuse and release RNA. Now, the release of RNA is extremely inefficient, is few percent. So there must be something going wrong at some point of this process. And there is a lot of work ongoing to try to understand. Now, what we were interested to see was it, what happens to the structure of this lipid nanoparticle once you lower pH? Does it remain the same? Does it redistribute? What happens? So what we did, again, we just continue to use the same formulation, same content of mRNA, and we just had different deuteration, uh, deuterated component. Yeah, just, just to have an additional um, uh, information. And again, we just collected Sun's curve, a different content of D2O, and again, we have a clear signature of the coercion structure of these particles, and then we drop the pH. And there is a very clear change. So I would say in the low Q, we have a clear change that is very, very visible at 68% D2O, where the coercion structure is lost, basically. And uh, you can see as well that the size is slightly increased. It's, it drops a bit a lower Q. And then the other clear change is the, um, is the rise of this internal peak. So before there was almost nothing. It's a bit unfortunate that we had the merging of the different Q range, but still I wouldn't say there is a clear peak here. But as soon as you lower pH, that comes out from background and it's very clear. And, um, and that means that not only the overall structure of your particle is changing, but the internal structure is kind of getting more ordered, which actually makes sense since a lower pH, the cardiogenic is really very charged. So it could kind of, yeah, induce more structure. So again, I used the Kershaw sphere model to fit this data, and I got very similar radius and thickness and scattering and values for scattering and density for current shell to what I found in other deuteration um, scheme before. And then when we lower pH, we basically add no shell, as it was already visible by just looking at the data. And we had a slightly larger radius for the overall particle. And the scattering density of the sphere is slightly lower than the core. So again, kind of suggests that we have a redistribution of this, um, of these components in a homogeneous way across the particle. So the pH drop does have a huge effect 
on the structure of this lipid nanoparticle. So this brings me to the kind of conclusion of this part. Uh, and uh, I hope it was clear that using suns and contrast matching, you can point out how the lipid components are distributed in lipid nanoparticle, and that can be translated to many other systems. And as well, we could see the effect of a protein binding to the lipid nanoparticle. Again, thanks to combining sounds and contrast matching. And we could as well follow the effect of pH on the particle in situ. And uh, this has been done all like in QVAT without dynamic change of condition. Uh, but one thing that it's, uh, it's very interesting and opens up a lot of possibility when you use SACS and SANS is that you can actually do time resolved measurements. And this is just an example that uh, from a recent review of book where they show the aggregation of uh, proteins and they could follow the change of scattering along time. And this is something that, uh, that is um, extremely powerful. And um, I may have already said what we used to make living nanoparticles is a microfluidic uh, mixing. So the idea that uh, we we um, we decided to pursue together with Tommy Nilander and a very bright PhD student was to look at the formulation in um, in situ, and that was possible uh, together in collaboration with the people at COSAX in Lund at Max Four, coupling the microfluidic with the with the SACS beam line, and this is just a picture of the setup that we had. And uh, what we did was to have our microfluidic chip with a, with a geometry that is used to make particles and do the formulation online. And this is work, uh, part, yeah, it's work of Jennifer Gilbert, who just defended our thesis. And uh, what, uh, so this is the, basically the chip, well, uh, yeah, it's like the, the macroscopic view of the chip. And we decided to measure it four different position, which actually translate uh, to four different time points along in the formulation. And, um, and here are reported uh, the uh, scattering curves collected at the different positions. So each curve is a different formulation because this happens in a very short time. So we have to remake the formulation every time and just look at the different point on the chip, but I think it's very, very fascinating that we can see the building up of the particle. So we see this, this intense low Q coming up and it's actually the particle being formed. And for this, uh, uh, for this cargo, which is DNA, you can see as well that the internal structure forms very quickly. This is on the millisecond scale, just to give you an idea. Uh, and, and for example, we can see differences between cargos. So, so this is polyadenylic acid, which is a model commonly used for uh, mRNA. And, uh, and it's clearly different uh, how it looks compared to the DNA one. And then what we did uh, was, uh, so um, the formulation happens, um, it's, it's a mixture of, uh, you have an ethanolic solution, ethanol solution of the lipids and the RNA is an acidic buffer. So you mix the aquas and ethanol solutions in the chip. So what happens at the outlet is that you have a mixture of aquas and ethanol and you need to get rid of ethanol and you need to increase the pH. So you do dialysis to bring, to get rid of ethanol and increase pH. And what we did then was to follow up as well, the structure upon dialysis. And you can, you can see how the, the peak evolves. So the internal structure evolve along the dialysis process. And then after concentration of the sample. So actually the scatter of this data is because the concentration is, is fairly low and then it becomes cleaner once we up-concentrate. 
So yeah, this is to, to I think, close that. I think it's interesting to uh, try to use this technique in, uh, in kind of more relevant uh, conditions and try to look at what happens over time, resolved over time. And um, this brings me to the end and to thank all the people that have been involved in this work and the funding agency and my the group that I am part of, of which I already collected quite some data, but I had no time to include, unfortunately, in this in this seminar. And thank you for attention. I'm happy to take questions.